Looks like Ron has joined Keith and JHM in the chat, so that's awesome. Oh, I need my watch on so I can double check the time throughout this. So we're just about ready to go live. Welcome in those of you who are here on the pre-show as we tech check the tech and make sure everything's solid. Um, am I missing anything crucial? Looks like I'm not on my notifications here. Awesome. Cool. So welcome in, Ron and Keith and John. We got JHM, Keith, and Ron here right now. And I'm going to go ahead and check my audio. Let me look over here to this screen, get my audio up, see how I am sounding, because my mic was set really low. Oh, that sounds okay. So in about 30 seconds, I'll hear myself do this test and be like, hey, it's Milky Way Wednesday. Welcome in. See if that's too loud. Looks solid, but uh, sounding good so far. If you guys who are here already want to give me a word, I think it's fine, right? I think everything is golden on audio. There I am saying the test. Okay, cool. I'm going to pull this down. I'm good. Hey, Argus Ray, welcome in from Santa Cruz. And we are about to go live in seven minutes. So seven minutes and counting. Gone is here. Always nice to be at Milky Way Wednesday. Hey, Gone Lacerna. Welcome in. Stoked to have you. I love your emojis being space and alien. That's awesome. <laughs> yes, welcome in. Let's see, where did this show up? Ah, right there. Cool. And I do need to kill some extra windows. Some stuff on here is just overly big, overly in the way. So let's kill some of those windows. Is this one that I can kill? Yeah, I can kill that one. So I'm just getting ready for us to go live here in about six minutes. Welcome in. Um, audio check has been done. The tech is connecting. And the first thing that maybe you three or four or five actually that are in here so far can help out. It's a little low for Argus. Okay, interesting. All right, let me double check for what I have over here. It does seem to be not in the yellow as much as normal. And I just felt like it was blasting on my end or at least at a level that's good. But Argus has come here every week. He knows. Let's try 26 on the gain. So let me try a new gain, Argus. See how that sounds. That should be putting me in the yellow levels pretty easily and pretty constant. But let's see if that made much of a difference. And so I should keep talking at this level, which is normally the volume of my voice as I am presenting. But I do have a link in my description that I hope those of you who are on right now have seen. This is where you are going to be submitting your images for the challenge for December. Remember, this December challenge is a winter Milky Way panorama. He said this better. Okay, awesome. Got you on the big screen. I have a bowl of popcorn and dog in my lap. I'm ready for tonight's show. Awesome, Jerry. <laughs> Keith says, there's tons of stuff that makes a good shot, but make taking inspiration from other genres helps and is underrated in my opinion. Sweet. Remind me of that point, Keith Chernick, because if... If I don't mention it on my own by the end of this, let me know because I do want to emphasize that because I'm going to focus on a few things. Ryan says we're sounding good. Awesome. Cool. We're starting in about four minutes. I have a few images that I want to pull up on this iPad. So let me make sure that I have them downloaded in those four minutes. I'm going to send you over to Aaron King talking to you about little lessons here and there. But uh, you've seen them before. I apologize for that, but enjoy. Day three, this is the third place I've gone. Didn't go very far because I went up to the silo the first time, then went up to Salt Flats, that's two hours north and back home, and then third night, the trestle. Actually, the silo is just about 14, 18 minutes up that direction. And so this is close to the silo and this is the train trestle. It's an abandoned train trestle. And three days into my 23 days of doing a Milky Way every night for the great Milky Way chase, oh, pfft. I have to admit, I think the challenge so far is that I'm not getting a lot of sleep. Just 
just like last night, I'm using this Rokinon lens. I think I'm gonna use the Rokinon lens every video. This is my Canon 5D Mark IV. At the trestle, there's a couple shots. There's this area that you can shoot down the tracks in a late Milky Way, and then you can also go down below. This railroad tie right here only goes so far. You can't see it in the shadows there, but it, it terminates at that point. It doesn't have any more railroad ties, and this band in like, wooden cool trestle is awesome and so I come here and I get a shot in the late Milky Way season and I go down all the way or I shoot down this and see the Milky Way all the way down at the end or I go down there and I capture what I'm gonna capture tonight I was just thinking about how scary it is coming here alone I don't know what it is about going across abandoned const constructions and buildings you you feel like everything's haunted I'm walking across this trestle already thinking about the ghosts and going no Aaron Keep it together. There's no ghosts here. There's nothing out here. You'll be fine. And then these two giant wings start flapping. And I think there were a pair of owls, maybe. Because birds typically don't fly at night. And they were too big to be bats. And they flew out from perched underneath this and scared the dickens out of me. Oh my god. So I'm going to get this done quickly. I'm out here now trying to set up my shot. This area below, can you see it? No, I can't see anything. There you go. That is the train trestle. Woo! So now I need to light this thing from this side where I can shoot through it and see the Milky Way. I've done this many times, but I'm wondering how I want to do it tonight because I want to have my lights come at a different angle than where I'm shooting from. So if I am shooting from around here and see the Milky Way over there, I want the lights to not be in this angle because then everything's really flat. I want it to have a nice oblique angle, crossing angle, perpendicular angle that's going to make this look good. So I think what I'll do is I'll put the light over there this time really, really low, shining across this way. Now first, I'm going to try a light behind because I have two lights. I just don't need to show you guys me. So I'm going to do a backlit rim light plus a side. I've never done that before. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to try that out. So I'm capturing right now. What I'm doing, before I turn this light off of me and I go and place it over there, I wanted to see how my rim lighting is looking. And so that is a little bit too bright. And so now I know to go back there, bring that down, and then come and highlight it. But it's, it's spooky looking. It's cool. I, I kind of like it. I am going around trying different compositions. This time of year, when the moon is not going to be up at 12.52 a.m., I can wait for the Milky Way to go more vertical and get the shot that I can get from over there, looking down the tracks, and the Milky Way is turning up, you know? So it's, it's nice. And so from here, being low, still kind of a cool arching panorama, what do I want to do? Do I want to put a Milky Way over this silo right here and then do a panorama like this? Or, I mean, on the right, there'll be this lit trestle, and on the left, there'll be dark silhouettes against the sky of a hill and a road and a fence. I don't know. I don't know what I'm loving, so I am keep trying different options. Check out these ones while I walk over there to the other side and try my typical composition. Okay, so I try. Okay, here we go. We're going to get started with Milky Way Wednesday. It is precise. Oh, 701. I'm a minute late. I'm a minute late. Hey, welcome in, everybody. Looks like we have a solid chat going right now. I see Katie in there, Andy, Ryan, Paolo, Kathy, Keith, Mr. Keith Kennedy, another Keith, Jerry, Argus, John, Argus. Oh, did I do it again? Because, oh, no, right there, Aaron. John from Minnesota, from Minnesota, sweet. And Gone, and Argus, and Ron, and John and Henry Maurice, JHM. So welcome in, everybody. I'm Aaron King with Photog Adventures. Tonight, for Milky Way Wednesday, we are talking about our first challenge. Now, I've already mentioned what the challenge is. It's a winter Milky Way panorama, where we get panoramas here in the Northern Hemisphere is looking that direction to the east. But then when you switch over to winter Milky Way panorama, we have it in the west to see that same shape panorama 
different part of the Milky Way galaxy. So the band that makes up the Milky Way band in the night sky doesn't include a galactic core, but it's still an existing panorama shape. That's fantastic. Now, what I have here is a link that I put in the description where I want people to post an image for the challenge. And so I'm going to post it again in the chat so everyone can see it. This is down below. It says submit photo for the December Milky Way photo challenge here. In fact, let me just show you over here on the IMAX screen. Uh, let me mute this audio so I'm not uh, talking again over myself. So if you look down here in the chat, or I'm not sorry, in the, in the chat, there's the chat. Woo Mark, Bob, Chris, hey, hey, hey. And going down to the description, you'll see submit photo for December Milky Way photo challenge here. And what that will do is open up this Google Photo folder. And I've created an album that is open and shared with everybody from Milky Way Wednesday at gmail.com. So when you click on that link, you should come right into here and see how you can submit it. And I'm hoping that one or two of you at least will go in here and submit an image today. If you want to just test it for me and it's not necessarily the panorama one, that is fine. Not needed for you to do the panorama right now. But if we could just see a test that you got a cool image that you want to put in here to show that everything is working on our end, that would be terrific. Hey, James Baker, welcome in. So I am stoked about getting your links here or your images here. And this is where I will see all the images for the December photo challenge from now until what was it? The 31st. Let me just look at my phone. <laughs> Over on Wednesday, the 7th through the 21st. The 21st of this month is when I will review the all the images. I will do a moment of envy on the best images and then reveal my top favorite for the December Milky Way photo challenge. So in the past, um, you know what? I after all the dozens of images that I prepared and got ready for today. This one image I thought of immediately. I'm like, oh, I wish I had that. <laughs> and I already don't have one of the images I wanted to have. Classic. There's always got to be a little bit of Aaron looking for um, images during a Milky Way Wednesday. That's just par for the course, right? Marketing. Going down to show you Neil Zingle's win from February of, I think, 2018. But it might be 2019. I can't recall. But this was the Photog favorite of 2019. Oh, I went past and I know it because I know it's in this folder. I used it just barely. Maybe it is in the templates folder, actually. Let's go back into that. Scroll, scrolly scroll, 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 scroll. And it's going to be in here towards the bottom. But that's a fantastic image by Neil Zingle. And I'm going to be showing you it to see how I favor the favorite. I show them off. I do a special Milk Monday moment of envy for it over on Facebook to feature the win the winner as well as post it on photogadventures.com. And I shouldn't have done this on extra large graphic because it's taking me extra long to see them. And this is going to be better. Scroll, 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 scroll. Got to be before then. Almost. I, I've almost got it. I know I had it just barely. I wish I had recalled that this would have been cool to have at the beginning. Almost there. Twitter banner. Instagram. Yes, yes. Keep going. Keep going. It is Neil Zingle's image over there in Joshua Tree at Skull Rock, and it is fantastic. Paolo, who's here tonight, he's in L.A. for a few more weeks, so he's able to join us live because normally he's out in Italia, in Italia. Um, in Udine, um, this picture we tried to capture ourselves with some failed success as we had a challenge, a major one. Oh, that's the image, but it doesn't show the Milky Way favorite. Oh, man, it's too bad. Oh, well, let's just at least show the image since I brought it up. This is the moment of envy right here talking about him being the photog favorite. And the thumbnail of this video, you'll see that, uh, um, that you can see... Oh, 
Cool, good request, Chris. Let's go ahead and do that for sure, especially here where we're in the beginning of the video where we have everyone involved. But you can see how this is the image that he captured in February during that challenge. It was not 2022. This was a moment of envy that I did this year featuring that old image because it was February and I wanted to show off how awesome February panoramas can be. Now we got a request. So before we go into our challenges today, I am going to be featuring so everyone's aware, doo -doo 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 -doo. let's get rid of this right now. I am going to be going through a bunch of great images and talking about these elements in our, oh, you've moved on me. How I hate you for moving so, so, so much. Let me get that out of the way so I can see what you're seeing. Perfect. Oh, it looks like Photoshop is taking up too much space in the background, kind of distracting from the chat. So this is what we're talking about today. Great images are in in my opinion, consist of composition, technique, and conditions. With those three key elements featured, prominently successful elements of composition, successful technique used, and success with the conditions, that will make a great image. And I break it down in these ways that you're seeing right here, right now. So we're going to come right back to this in a moment. But... Let's first talk about the request that came in. I'm gonna go ahead and show Chris's request right here. Show in Stellarium a Milky Way pano that is a winter Milky Way pano. And it's like, oh yeah, good idea. We've talked a lot about it in multiple weeks on Milky Way Wednesday, but I haven't actually shown you it on Stellarium. So let's do it. He says, I can see two opportunities right here. I can see two opportunities early evening and just prior to dawn. Yes, that's different on each month, but he's right. And so let's go ahead and look at Stellarium and see what he's talking about. So let's go full screen on this, and you can see, you know what? Maybe I'll bring the chat out for a moment so that we can just focus on what Stellarium has. And, um, oh, okay, good. It went, it went blue for a second there. And what about me? Do I have a smaller version of me? I think I do. And I am going to minimize this one and go to this one and make me even tighter. So, yeah, I'm here. I exist. In fact, I'm just going to take up this space down here because you're not going to need this space down there to see everything. So when I'm in Stellarium, if you're not familiar with it, this down on the bottom shelf over on the PC program, you can turn off the horizon. But what I want to turn off next to it is the atmosphere so you can really see that band of the Milky Way. And if I zoom out, roll backwards, you can see where the Milky Way is currently on December 7th, 2022. That's where everything is. The core is down at this point. If I take off the horizon, you can see how that's the core right there. And it's under the horizon in the southern hemisphere, but for us, we're not seeing it. And this is the band of the Milky Way that is the winter Milky Way. Well, let's go forward in time. And I'm going to go forward in days. So I'm going to pull up my date and time window. And we're just going to go forward in days. So let's go when there's a moon free night. So that's not distracting. And let's look at this. So if you were to start exactly right now, you would have probably some sun. Let's look at the atmosphere. There's still some light. Let's go forward in hours. Actually, and there's not. That was just light pollution and not light. So let me go ahead and kill that atmosphere again. You could potentially do not a directly west pano, but you'd be looking directly north. But this is a very tall, right above you, high elevation one. If you are looking at my um, photo pills, oops, doo -doo 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 -doo. We talked about a point where the Milky Way band is visible. See these dots right here? These dots represent the Milky Way currently. Let's just go to right now. This north, looking north right here, looking west and looking east, this section of the Milky Way is what we're seeing on Stellarium right here. This is that Milky Way shape, but you can see how it's pretty much on top of us. So what we do is we use this information down here below where you can see that the Milky Way galactic center is at this point below the horizon, but the Milky Way max elevation is 66 degrees. So what we're looking for is when that max elevation goes back down to a point where it's manageable and not considering what daytime it is. We want between 55 or 52 down to 
22. 22 to 55, I think is what I said, but my favorite is 30 to 45. So anywhere from like 45 is a little bit high, but not too bad. And the sweet spot all the way down to 30 degrees. That's where it's high enough off the horizon, but also not too high up in the sky. So let's look at something like this. 5.35 a.m. on Thursday morning. So let's just go forward. I went back to a different day. So let me go back to today, the 7th. Uh-huh. Oh, wait, no, I changed months. Let me go back to December 12th and go back a few days. December 12th, or December, December 7th, and go forward. And actually, this will change for us. It'll go into the morning of, what was that again? 5.35 a.m. So now you can see what's happening. The Milky Way came from being high above our heads to getting lower and lower and lower. And at 512, now we're looking at a very western Milky Way on the side here. So you can see all of that shape right there is the panorama still. It's the same height as a very beautiful high Milky Way Galactic Core Pano, but it's using this edge of the world, that this edge of the, the Milky Way galaxy that isn't as defined, isn't as bright as it is looking at the core. You've got Orion right there. In this case, you have the moon and this day, but you've also got planets standing out, bright stars, and other elements that will be better visible over here on Sky Guide. So let me pull up my sky guide. This is the last thing we'll do, then we'll get into the composition stuff. It's already 7.13, so I'm like blowing through our time here. So do, 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 do. let's go forward in time all the way until 5.30. Let's stop right there. Let's go back to like 5.15 or something. Cool. So 5.15, this is going to give us an example of that really distinct color that we're going to get looking at this side. we got really bright nebulas within Orion, above Orion. You've got up here the Rosette Nebula, and you've also got oh Christmas Tree Cluster. That's cool. I didn't know it was called that. I haven't looked at that and noticed that before. Christmas Tree Cluster, and then the really crazy sharp, almost looking like an artifact in your image, is the California Nebula. And then you've got what's going on in Auriga, which is the Flaming Star Nebula and nothing else named quite without that zooming in more. So you can see that band is going to have all sorts of definition, but faint with the dust lanes and some stars drawing it out with the nebulas really being the star of the show if you get an Astro Modified camera. So hopefully we've hit Chris Whiting's request. This is that winter Milky Way. And he says there's two opportunities, one right after um, prior to dawn and one early evening. And so when we're talking about early evening, let's go back a few hours. So right after 18, 6, 17, so it gets dark right about here, going into 6 p.m. Let's go into 7 p.m. There is an opportunity to capture this, but it's a little bit high. What's our, what's our iPad say? Let's go back to right now. This time, you can see that Milky Way is 66 degrees elevation, and it starts going down. It goes perfectly vertical from about 66. So a very, very wide angle can pull this off without too much of a problem. It's just not as strong to me personally where it is when it's lower. So Chris is correct. We can get a pano while it's still dark and it's not totally vertical early in the hours, 7.15 and this is 7.42. So it's roughly about like this. Looking from the west to the east and a highest point of the Milky Way arch being in the north, you can still capture a very wide angle pano. And then you can want, if, if you want to, you can wait until the more opportune time where it starts to lay down and set, as you can see as I go through the hours right here. Let's look directly west. As the hours come, the Milky Way curves and then starts to set and create that panorama arch that oh, I just love. And then it's flat. This is like the February Milky Way right there. That's how flat it is. All right, cool. So we nailed that, I think, Chris. Hopefully he's good. And too high, yep, he says. Perfect. I dropped an old panel in the folder for a test. Okay, cool. Jo Choi, thank you so much. Let's see if that pulled through. And I'm going to refresh this page. And ha yes. So look at that. Success, everybody. We have Okay, I got it, Google, I got it. We have how your images will show up to me. I can click on them, I can see your full image. Hopefully you'll give me one high enough resolution that it's easy for me to work with, as well as 
without that showing the info, I can see that Joe Choi submitted it. So if you have a Gmail account that you preferred being attached to, this is your name who submitted this. Like if you have some really funny, like crazy Gmail account that you don't realize is going to be seen, make sure you use one that you love that you're okay with me commenting on. Because if I don't know exactly what your name is, I'm going to use the username that shows up here as the, oh, it looks like, you know, coffee lover, buddy lover 29 over there is the one who submitted this image. And you wish I would have just said Steven, then make sure you use a Gmail account that is Steven. And Chris Woodruff also gave us an image. And this is showing off that California nebula right there. And all of what we saw in Ariga, I think the Christmas tree one is over here. While this, ah, that's the Christmas tree one, isn't it? And this was what was in Ariga. And this is heading towards Rosette, going down to Scorpius, or maybe I might be right on that because that's Andromeda. So down here would be Orion, somewhere over there. But this is a cool, cool shot. And so was Joe's shot right here. And this is how I will pull the images down, do my picks, get my moment of envy set up for those that are the top images. And then from those top images, at the end of the show, I will declare my favorite, the Milky Way challenge, photo challenge favorite for that month. And every month we'll have that. So the 21st, we'll come back with our Milky Way panorama, panorama like this, but with a winter Milky Way. Cool. Thanks for doing that, you two. I love seeing that that worked, that I didn't have any sort of permission issues, and that was fantastic. So let's get into our discussion today about what makes a great image. And the way that I want to start that is talking about a couple elements of just what composition, technique, and conditions give us. You know, just a couple highlight elements that those three things, like, let me say this better. My mind is going two different directions right now. I want to feature an image that's great for each one of these three, and then I'm going to go through each one of these points and discuss them with image examples using just one subject. We're going to only use images from Delicate Arch. I went and found images online that came from Delicate Arch to use only them to talk about what's great and working about their images, and since they're all the same subject, it helps us kind of see the differences easier, and it's a very obvious. Oh, Ryan asked, what months are eligible? every month. Now, this December Milky Way challenge is specifically a winter Milky Way panorama. The second challenge is going to be in January, which is going to involve, I think I decided a couple Milky Way Wednesdays ago exactly what the challenge would be. I'm going to post the whole calendar year's challenges so that we can all look forward to them. But when it comes to what months are eligible, his question might be asking, if I captured it in November, can I submit it for the December challenge? Yes. It's not required that you capture it within that month. Just submit it because I know that not everyone can get out every month. I'm going to try and encourage you to do it. I'm going to have challenges that are specific to what's going on that month. But if you have an old image from maybe a year ago that works really well for it and you love it, submit it for that challenge. Totally fine. Totally fine. Um, ba -ba 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 -bum. Where do we submit? Tim Farmer's wondering. Look in the description of the video. Let me show everybody again real quick since I'm going to go over to my main sc my screen anyway. So you can see right here, Tim, underneath this video that you're watching right now, well, that's the chat. Will you post them in the guild? I am definitely going to post the favorite in the guild. I'm not going to post everyone's image in the guild. Um, no, I won't be doing that. Just the video of me talking about it, that I can post in the guild if you'd like. But here's the link. Submit the photo for December Milky Way Photo Challenge here. I will put this in every Milky Way Wednesday video this month. So you'll see, hey, tonight on Milky Way Wednesday, I'm doing blah, 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 blah. Join me live at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll have the link like this, and you can always come back in here, click that. It will open up a Google folder that has other submissions that have already been submitted, as well as opening an opportunity for you to just, oh, yeah, I want to submit a picture. And you click Join, and then you have access to submit images. Awesome. Cool, 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 cool. All right, so these, uh, you know what? Hmm, let's bring back our chat, turn off small Aaron, and, oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to turn off small Aaron. There he is, right here, and turn back on big Aaron. Hello. Okay, that cleans up our space a little bit nicer. 
So looking at these things, composition, technique, and conditions, what is Aaron King talking about? Well, first off, let's tackle composition. An image that really shows off a balance of composition is this Milky Way image right here where it goes, ah, these ones look so similar. Um, it's this one. Yeah, that one. <laughs> They're so similar, these last two. So if we look at this, and I'm going to make this even bigger. Uh, let's just zoom in then. This is an image that I found that has a great balance of composition when it comes to all of the elements on the screen. You've got a Milky Way in a proper position that's not being blocked out too much by the feature, the subject of the Delicate Arch. Delicate Arch has a really neat organic shape that's filling up the frame is obviously the dominant focal subject of this image as long as well as the Milky Way core. And this is fantastic balance complete with him in the picture it's a great image the other element that makes a great image is technique and you want to have really solid technique to make your image high quality and the image i want to show off for that is mary beth's image over here and i've lost it where does the screen ah there it is mary beth's image here technique comes into this image to make the sky brilliant with Astro modified camera on a star tracker blending the sky with the foreground capture that she did during a different twilight period or just a long exposure of the foreground so the technique that brings in visibility on the milk on the foreground as well as great visibility on the activity in the sky that is what's making her image great technique and then lastly I talk about conditions and when you think about conditions, you go to Delicate Arch and you're like, oh man, cool. I got a picture of Delicate Arch. Compositionally, it's on a good rule of thirds. It has a leading line even at the bottom, a couple leading line texture points where these are leading us towards the humans in the great silhouette. It's obviously the dominant feature. It's obviously what we're capturing, even though we see a lot of detail and information over here in arches, our eyes are drawn to Delicate Arch. We know that it is. So this is a fantastic image. All the elements came together and worked, but the conditions didn't work, not as much as this one. Same position, a little bit less, because this guy had even better leading lines in the foreground where this guy cut it off, but his image is better because, or hers, I don't know, Sasa could be a girl. Her image is even better than his because she has the conditions that are starting to make it nice. So now the great image is like, ooh, that's kind of good. I like it. But it could even be better. Conditions can be even more amazing as I just love. Oh, I don't like that. I just love this image. And I just kind of wish it was off to the left a little bit more. So I'm going to pull it right here. Look at how great the conditions really came into play on this image to take a moment of delicate arch and it just sings it just sings so we're going to break down each one of these points about what makes a great image but i had to highlight these right at the beginning which is now 24 minutes in so <laughs> we're gonna have to bust through the rest oh, i love this image it's fantastic the atmosphere of the sunrise with the inverted clouds so so cool <laughs> So jealous of this shot. So jealous. So now let's talk about the clear subject in composition. What do I mean by a clear subject? What is going to stand out is the subject that you're focusing on. I chose delicate arch, and it's kind of an obvious subject. But sometimes, um, let's go into this folder. Sometimes your subject is not going to be obvious. It's just the entire scene. I mean, this image, which I have burned through a million times showing you, the subject is obviously the entire scene, but there are elements that are highly favored and dominant, like the Milky Way, this impression of that canyon down below, and this long leading line here. So the subject needs to be clear that that's what you're capturing. This is a Milky Way panorama. The subject of this image right here has a big rock that's an obvious subject. Well, let's look at some example subjects uh, right here on, I'm going to do this one. 
Let's see, where are you? Right here. The subject focus of delicate arch can have so many different ways to handle it. Notice that as the clear subject is the arch, there's also some mishandling and fantastic handling of the silhouette of delicate arch that's handled in different images, in each one of these images in the frame. So let's just look at what's happening in this one right here. Uh, let me make sure I got a pen that's very visible. How's this on the rock? Not so bad. So if you're looking at what's delicate arch, it's this shape. There's the inside of the shape, and then the shape comes up here. This is delicate arch, but it's totally lost. The silhouette's totally lost against the rock in the background. So what's lost in this image is the clear subject is kind of camouflaged. These two images right here are very similar. I cut them off at the top just because of what I wanted to show off is that the other consideration, especially for delicate arch, is how high up do you have your horizon? You've got this line right here that is coming in, and this is two-thirds below, one-third above. This is two-thirds below, one-third above. This is 90%. I mean, look at that. This is 90% is the background of that hill, while there is only a tiny little opening where you can see the silhouette of the sky, which is drawing a little definition on the rock. The balance of something like this, where you have a lower horizon, it's giving you shape that is obviously interesting on delicate arch that is visible and clean. Even this one is clean thanks to the snow line and the highlight color of the sun hitting that edge. You see the silhouette. So is there a right and wrong amount of delicate arch versus background? Mm, I would say the only wrong would be to lose it in here, to overfill it. That's where it's wrong. The rest of them, whether you are getting your horizon as you know, as low as here, 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 here. This is where it just gets a little too high, but it can work, as you see in Mary Beth's image. She has a very, very tight, tight line where the horizon is here, but you see the distant mountains of the LaSalle's right there, and you get that tiny opening. But thanks to her exposure, you're seeing definition. It's not up against orange rocks. Um, do, 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 do. There. It's not up against these orange rocks that makes it get lost. It's up against a subject that's quite obviously different. And it even has two lines, this horizon line plus the mountain line and then the sky. And it still works. It can work. But you do need to make a special attention to what your subject is and whether or not it is clear. So another example is this unique view of this entire area. As I go through all of these images of Delicate Arch, if you've never been here, I wanted to paint a picture as to what people are working with. Those leading lines that I was loving are right here, leading up into the arch shape, which then you know closes off this shape. Oh, why did that go away? Can you just write? Okay, it closes off this shape of Delicate Arch, where you see in pre in other images like this one, Mary Best, you got the iconic view, thinner rock on the left, thicker rock on the right. That is the iconic view. That is lost a little bit here, quite a bit, honestly, in this image showing the pano. But you can see how this slopes down pretty dramatically down into this pit. In fact, where you're not seeing right here is actually a drop off. It's gradual sloped here. You get around here and walk into this position, but from here you kind of fall into it. It's a little bit of a steep downfall, down in, downcline, incline. It's a steep hill to drop right into that little lobster pot of that area. And so as people gather and come around this spot and walk over here to go over to that spot, you can stand up here, and you can stand here, 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 and then people just fill up all of this shape right here, capturing Delicate Arch. You have photographers everywhere. And so when you see people's composition and their take on Delicate Arch, you're going to see that some people will come up here and shoot this direction and have a nice third with the Delicate Arch and come over here to see the Milky Way coming off of it like that. But then some people will focus on a vertical composition where you've got Delicate Arch featured in the middle, center weighted, and a vertical or tilted Milky Way. So we're going to be dealing with all sorts of that to focus on how our subject looks good. 
So we're looking at a clear subject is going to bring your composition to its strongest point, having that clear, clear subject showing up. But then you've also got to worry about edge to edge. How is your composition from the edge to the other edge? Are you forgetting about anything? Is there anything that you wish you had done differently? And now, my example right here is 1 and 2. Am I losing track of what 1 and 2 is? Oh, crap. Why did I call it that? Bad 1 and 2. <laughs> Which images are those? 1 and there's not even a 2. Bad, 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 bad. Huh. I don't recall what I thought. I think... Let's look at this one. Let's look at all of these as you go through. You've got an edge-to-edge -edge composition. Where did those go? That's interesting. I wonder what I considered. Huh. Wow, I, I have this note to know the edge to edge bad one and two, but now I'm looking at my images and how I labeled them. None of them stand out as one and two, so it's not helping me find them. So I'm going to go quickly through some of these image examples and show off the edge to edge. When you're dealing with your composition, let's look at this pano. This is a good example of not featuring your subject very clearly, and yet it is there, obviously. But what's going on over here that is interesting? What's going on on edge to edge? This is a panorama. He's trying to make a panorama work, and it is turning out nice. He has the moon, obviously, lighting up his terrain. As you can see all the light there. Then he has some other light lighting up this section on his closest rock because I guess there was some shadow from rocks behind. As you saw in that one image, it's a higher rock, so he probably wanted to get rid of that shadow, which is causing a bit of an orange color to yellow color to the naturally lit, you know, rocks over here with the moon. So you want to pay attention to what is a distracting element in your image from edge to edge. Um, Aaron, did you, did you did you think that some of these were good examples of edge to edge? <laughs> yeah, I can't even remember which one was edge to edge. So let's just move on to the next point. Because I think you get it that there are distracting branches, debris, bad silhouettes that are really drawing your eye that you don't want to be drawn. Those things on the edge of your frame can really ruin it, especially if it starts drawing the eye of the attention and focus of your main subject away from it. So you want to pay attention to those things edge to edge. Now, the DL great. Ah, yes, yes, yes. This one is the rule of thirds. When you're looking at the design elements, you're familiar with rule of thirds, balance, leading lines, to name a few. And I'm also going to talk about dominant and subdominant. I was just talking to an artist that I was meeting this week. She is an artist that focuses in abstract art. And so I was asking her how she handles things when you don't have an obvious subject in this abstract art that is sitting on the rule of third or sharing a center weighted shot or has a leading line to it because we're talking abstract dots and lines and scratch marks almost that just take up from edge to edge on our, on our canvas. How do you draw the eye? How do you control your design when it's so abstract? And she says a dominant element versus a subdominant element is what they end up focusing on and keying on. And so when you're looking at the rule of thirds, this image from Royce Bear, it's an old image from Royce Bear, actually. As I look for delicate arch, I accidentally came upon this Royce Bear image to see a good rule of third. He's got nice there with the delicate arch. Our subject is showing up on that third, and then everything else is off to the left with a little bit of extra space on the right. The other good example is in balance, I use this one has terrific balance with where the Milky Way is. And that's something that I wanted to show off in these three images right here. Oh, and you know what? I got to kill this frame so you can see. So these images right there, they're showing off different forms of capturing the Milky Way plus our subject, Delicate Arch. Over in this one, the Milky Way is very low to the horizon. In this one, 
we have a Milky Way that's kind of cleared the delicate arch entirely, but then you're left with some negative space between here and here where those stars are taking up a lot of room in your composition, throwing, you know, the Milky Way galactic core is really that big because you've got that line of dust lanes coming up to the Roa Fuki complex. And so our eyes still enjoy that section of the sky. And these out here are the negative space stars versus the other side. So when you're looking at your Milky Way, he's got it bunched up to the right and doesn't have enough breathing room there. He has all of his negative space in this side. With Royce Bear's composition, his Milky Way is going right through a very comfortable space. If you even kind of crop it in, you've got a nice looking Milky Way plus delicate arch balanced nicely. And then the negative space over here, I think Royce would even say that back then he had a little bit too much extra space on the right. But we're talking a decade ago? I mean, this is a long time ago when he captured this image. I don't know when, but this is long before his most recent stuff. You can see that he doesn't even have any detail on the rocks down below, and Royce loves detail on the rocks. So then, talking about our other point, which is, let me just remind you right here, composition has a clear subject. Keep your elements interesting and not distracting from edge to edge. And then input design elements that we've already talked about that we many, many times have talked about. But then the dominant and subdominant. And dealing with that dominant and subdominant, I want to look at that grid again. If you're looking at how the elements are handled here, you've got an obvious dominant feature of delicate arch versus the rest of the background. But the way that you've lined them up, it's some of these can be not all that good, especially this one. This one is dominant still and very strong. You lose some of the shape, the iconic shape, but it is still an obviously dominant feature against the rest of the scene. And when you're looking at some of the edges here, when you have your subject is clear and focused on, you're going to want to avoid cropping any element of it off. And myself, personally, I prefer this one on the left as on the edge it's got some room to grow, room to breathe, versus how it's been chopped off there. So as you're working with your dominant subject, make sure it has a full clearance, a full focus. This one in the middle, while there's a beautiful sky going on, you've cropped off the lower part of the delicate arch and you have a ton of empty space up here in the sky, and that's too bad. That's too bad for getting the best out of delicate arch. This is your dominant feature, this is your focal subject, and it's a little lost here, cut off at that bottom. So let's talk about technique, because technique is going to be far less obvious compared to composition. Composition is something we've all been thinking about, and some of you do even naturally and have loved it. So when you're looking at technique, I break it down with whether your image is clean, whether your exposure has enough quality in it, as well as your post-processing, the way you handle it is going to be an element of strength in the image versus drawing distracting elements into it with your post-processing. And Chris, that's <laughs> you're awesome. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> so looking at this list that I have for showing off clean, it is DL3 conditions. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. I love it when it's obvious. <laughs> I don't know why I wrote such poor notes. So this is image one and two of the conditions. And these stand out to me as being clean. The way the technique is handled, there's nothing about the image that is noisy. W a, an example of where it's not good is this one right here. Milky Way Low. What? Oh, I hate it when I write things like that because that's not even in any of those names. Milky Way low, Milky Way low. What was I doing writing that low and high? Hmm. Hmm. I think it's because I was comparing this one with this one. Yeah, I think that's what it was. I was talking about low noise and high noise. So when you're thinking about this image right here, the clean capture of it, there's nothing distracting. It all has the smoothness of the sky pinks hitting it, continuing all the way down the rock, hitting these rocks. I don't notice how noisy or if noisy noise even comes into play at all in this image. And in this image, it's butter. 
It is just delicious. It is fantastic. With the snow kissing the rock, you don't even think about the contour lines, anything going on. None of the elements that you see in the other images of this rock down below, you don't even worry about it because your eye is focused entirely on the highlights of the snow compared to the glowing fog and smo uh, smoke, the glowing inverted clouds plus the sky. It is just glorious. And what's interesting is on the rule of thirds here, this is the only image where this is where the delicate arch is handled on the third instead of being on the right. As you have a nice sun being very bright and bringing color throughout the landscape, all of a sudden what was here's the best version of handling the rule of thirds, dealing with it this way, all of a sudden um, this looks stronger and it's all brought on by your conditions. Just to emphasize how when you're dealing with a great image, your composition might have some different focus points or you're weighted a little bit differently on how you handle the rule of thirds thanks to how the conditions are informing your decision. You have a different condition here to think about. So let's go into the cleanly cleanliness of this. Now, this is by virtue of capturing a Milky Way in the dark. I mean, we have, this is a classic old 2016 Milky Way shot for all of us where we saw a really great Milky Way. We lit it up here with our torch or our flashlight. We got that arch looking nice, but we didn't have much that we could do down below here. He had a ton of noise and whether he, you know, in Photoshop smudged it up a little bit or maybe tried to clean it up and then post-processing, just something he did here made this low quality instead of high quality like this example right here. If you zoom in and pixel peep, this is out of focus. And this is low res coming from the website, and so you can't even take in all the glory that it probably has, all the high definition that is probably all there. But looking at the technique that was used here versus this image, oh, why is this not responsive? Because I zoomed in a little bit. Because of this image, Okay, that image there. Okay, going back and forth, the technique here has lost the great image. It's only a good image where here it becomes a great image because the technique helped create it. And as you're looking at my notes, clean. Being clean is one of the things that people will love, whether they're photographers or not. They will be drawn to your image with the cleanliness of it. Now that exposure quality, that causes some scenarios. As you look at these three Milky Ways, and let me just kill all of my notes on here and put back the color. You see three different handlings of processing the Milky Way. Roger Clark will stab Royce in the neck for his blue Milky Way, but there's some really high quality sky in the single image compared to what's going on over here. Now with the conditions, his clouds are making the Antares complex and Scorpius look awesome. You've got a planet and then you've got all of these stars just really popping and it's before the Milky Way's even come up and there's a satellite right there. So when you're looking at conditions, he didn't have everything he needed to make that shine the way that the post-processing is handling the Milky Way up here. Now this is low res, it's not featuring the image as well as it could, but you can see what I mean that there's just an element of we capture with single images, we bring up our exposure, and it can make or break it. This one handled it well, a completely different color than Royce's, but it handled it still very well. And with that quality of our technique, we can really make or break a solid image as you're dealing with the quality of uh, how good your sky looks. When I'm zipping back and forth between all of these, you can probably feel inside you drawn to some of the skies just the way that you start to see some quality, some definition, some clarity that you didn't have in the previous ones. This one that's a little bit out of focus, it's soft and not so noisy, but there's a lot to love about the density of stars in this one. There's a lot to love about the composition of this as the technique in the post-processing was all crazy solid. In fact, this one should have been featured earlier, close good. That's not 
there. No, that's not up there. Oh, I should have featured that on the dominant versus subdominant. That's why. This is a really cool image that I haven't featured quite yet. And as I was talking about composition, I didn't get a chance to mention it, but you notice this Milky Way coming through and intersecting at the vertical orientation and how they all handle it in a different way. Milky Way off to the right of Delicate Arch. Mil Milky Way going inside but hugging the right. Milky Way going through it, intersecting where it fills up the middle a little bit more. And do I have that one that went perfectly vertical through it? That must have been only on the internet, and I'm just remembering it. But this one, I this is not the core. This is handled differently, but I absolutely love it. And the technique here is a blend. Let's look back at my notes. As you look at exposure quality and being clean, one of the bonus points I wanted to make is that tracking or using a blend with that technique can help bring cleanliness and exposure quality into your image and make your post processing in some way easy to fe feature the Milky Way but also hard because now you're handling a blend of a sky and a foreground and as you can see in this situation that is a daytime rock that is daytime rock you can tell the way that the light is hitting it and he's blended a daytime capture in with the night sky and up here the technique was flawless. Up here, pretty good. I, I can notice some halo, but it's not, not terrible. Over here, it got weaker. You know, you can see that serious halo where in your post-processing and the way you handle it can make or break a great image. And this edge down here is a little bit obvious. It's more obvious zoomed out than it was zoomed in, actually. Zoomed in, it kind of blended nicely. But you can see where there are some halo points. And you'll find that as you deal with the rock that you'll have an edge that you do a, a select mask and it'll be perfect on this edge, but on this edge, it's not. Like, I zoom in and pixel peep this edge, I can't see any haloing. It just happened to be brilliant with the way the sky was. Over here, because of a shadow side of the rock, it doesn't work as well. There is some contrast drawn that makes it more challenging for automatic, and you have to go in there. And you have to go pixel by pixel and fix with cloning it out, stretching it, moving it, whatever you want to get rid of that extra halo. Or you can go through Mary Best's lessons on her Milky Way post-processing course for Star Tracker and learn how she handles it with a bunch of different channel adjustments that are keying on the differences between the subject and the sky and it, she has some great techniques that really perfect it pixel by pixel to grab the subject out and this is an easy subject being rock versus you know say trees and branches so let's go back into the notes post-processing exposure quality clean and then tracking and blends and to show off tracking and blends i can only do this by showing off two of my favorite photographers who use this tracking this is the main focus is Mary Best's tracking and bringing out Delicate Arch with a long exposure and tracking the night sky. I mentioned it already. But blends is a blue hour blend technique. And you can see that Jess Santos has a style, has an absolute style that she takes advantage of here in her blue hour blend. Let me just out of, out of, um, due to time and out of order, let me just mention these key notes. When you're handling a landscape image, there's some elements that can help you get towards a great image that if you focus on them faster than maybe trying to make all the other elements come together. How do I mean that? If say numbers one through five were great steps to a good image, I'm telling you that if you take two of these, you'll have a good image faster than if you tried to make sure that all one through five existed in your image. Trying to make sure your composition includes elements one through five can be overwhelming and impossible in some situations. So when I'm thinking about one and two or three things that will really benefit you, this list is it. In landscape photography, I personally really favor a hyper foreground having focus stacking come involved there when you're dealing with a hyper foreground as well as on the milky way side if you light your foreground you might end up having to focus stack it and deal with it in mary best example here you don't see anything close enough that she had to focus stack but she quite famously does that with an image this is a landscape shot but you can see how she had to focus stack the ice crystals on this rock as well as focus stack the detail in, oh, let's see what I want to bring up. I, there's so many images of hers that I absolutely adore. 
Um, let's go up to one of her more recent ones that are just gorgeous in Canada. Just gorgeous. I mean, look at the texture of the of the ice down here going out to the night sky and Orion right there. <laughs> oh, gosh. Look at the detail inside there. Oh, that's fantastic. Having a hyper foreground subject that leads into your frame, leads into your cool sky, leads into, say, a Milky Way. Actually, that's not a good example of a hyper foreground because this is not a hyper foreground. Let's go to a cool hyper foreground. Oh, boy, right here. Here's a Milky Way over a mountain. You could have cropped all of this out, and it would be an interesting shot, especially with the meteor blast right here. But look at what's happening in the water that Mary Beth has found. She has a keen eye for stuff like this. And you get that hyper foreground subject, and you focus stack it and bring the rest of your image in, and you also got a Milky Way. Man, you have just jumped from good image to brilliant image. And Mary Beth is fantastic at it, and that's why she's so loved. And Jess Santos is brilliant at two elements of those notes, the Blue Hour Blend as well as color design. In Milky Way, you got a Blue Hour Blend, and then color design becomes kind of a after product, a byproduct of doing the Blue Hour Blend because you can do a color-focused purposeful color theme throughout your image and if you look at Miss Jess Bess on Instagram that's her Instagram name or handle but it's Jessica Santos if you look at Jessica's images you'll see that she has an absolute theme of purple in her images yes she'd probably get neck punched by Roger Clark as well but she has a really cool style that it's hard not to love as you see that this is a blue hour capture of these really neat rocks out and looks like the Bistai area and you've just got fantastic detail where you wouldn't have otherwise you remember our example of kind of the bad bad Milky Way rock yeah this is what we all deal with all the time of dealing with this kind of low exposure information that blue hour blend saves that. It's more technique, it's more effort, but that is a way to go to a great image. And the last thing is just the clear purposeful subject. Making sure that exists on your image is important. And we've been, I've hyper uh, discussed that and beat that dead horse this entire night about making sure that the subject is very treated well and handled. In fact, that was a good example of not treating it well. So I want to bring that up while I'm on the topic. So as you're looking at other silhouettes, other silhouettes, and other silhouettes. These feature Delicate Arch. Iconic, strong, Delicate Arch, Milky Way through the window. Milky Way and yourself through the window. Landscape in the background, not the iconic shape, but a terrific one. Fantastic image. This one is unique, cool. But could you know that it's Delicate Arch? This is where you have to balance whether or not the subject being Delicate Arch and obvious to the viewer is important or not. If someone looks at your image and they can't tell it's Delicate Arch, but it is a cool image and you don't care, then fantastic. But if you're trying to say, here's my one you know, perfect Delicate Arch shot and you go for something abstract like this, you're losing the thread of your purposeful subject that said, if it wasn't an arch, you wouldn't get a starburst like this on both sides. You ever capture a starburst of a distant sunset where it's hitting the mountains and you're looking at that starburst that basically here, imagine like here's my head is the rock shape and then bing, you've got the star points coming off of the one side. You know, it's coming off here off of the top of the rock. You don't have that problem here because you have two edges of rocks causing starbursts to go both directions. In fact, all 360 degrees around the sun, which is what makes this so dang strong and such a cool image of delicate arch. And I wanted to feature it, but point out the fact that you have a give and take here Dominant subject, very fantastic capture of the sun. The conditions aren't even all that perfect for a great sunset, but this image is still terrific because of the creative, uh, the, the creative capture of the sun, the starburst that's not typically possible where you get a full 360 degrees like that, and that's so cool. And it's only possible because of that arch is pinching in on both sides and causing a starburst to happen both directions, all directions. It's, it's really quite cool. So when you're thinking about some key elements you want to focus on, I would go hyper foreground or a lit foreground, do a blue hour blend, and get some color design. Focus on that. I didn't think I was going to bring this up, but Ted Gore, 
Ted Gore images. He has great color grading and color design as he handles these throughout his photography where you've got color here that's shared between the rest of the elements. Look at how this one's almost monochromatic of that gray to purple to white to black. I mean, actually, I don't even say black. It's just kind of a gray shot into it. All of this handles a color theme from top to bottom, edge to edge, not just getting rid of distracting elements on your edge, but he carries a color design throughout the image, edge to edge. He does it fantastically, and so does my favorite, Erin Bobnick. She is fantastic at color design, and this is a great example of it right here. As you can see in this image, um, where am I going to see it large? Let's go large right here. Oh, don't just resize on me. Book my trip now. I'm not going to. But you can see how there is in the gray of this cloud cover. Sorry, not needed. You can see the color of the purple flowers kind of throughout all of this. If you were to pixel peep the dark pixels in the sand dune, the dark pixels of the clouds, and the dark pixels here between the highlights in the sand, you would probably see the same purple as some of the darker petals on here. That is how you color design your image, and you bring in from contrasting shadows to highlights. Your shadows have a color, or your highlights have a color that's shared with your subject's color. The color of the subject is a bit pinkish to purple, and so pink to purple and mostly purple is all throughout this image and featured fantastically. And Aaron Bobnick does a fantastic job of color design throughout our images, like Ted Gore. So you got to feature these elements to try and bring an image that's okay into a great image. All right, let's end this with our final points over here. Conditions. I've already spilled the beans on the conditions, but conditions is entirely up to you and God. I mean, you can't control the conditions. There's just nothing you can do but pray and show up a lot. Going a lot is your key trick compared to hoping that it works out. I want to show you a night that I had out at the Salt Flats. Here is an image that I'm trying to capture at the Salt Flats, and I found this really cool texture. And as the conditions are just boring and sun setting, I'm taking some pictures and examples of how the light is hitting this rock, this like crystallized salt right there. As the night continues on, the light gets to a point where it is really highlighting the right side and really contrasting the left side, and it got way stronger compared to this one. It almost seems faded and boring compared to this one. It's like, ooh, that's great. And then my final Milky Way time shot is light pollution heavy, in which I was like, oh, no, Wendover's terrible. This is years ago, and I'm realizing I hate Wendover for light pollution. Oh, my gosh. And you've got the moon still up. That's what this highlight is right here. Well, as I waited for the moon to go down and the Milky Way to go vertical, I end up with this kind of okay image. This is without the foreground image combined. This is just what the one image looked like with the Milky Way up here. So the salt flats, you would think, Coming here, coming this one time, I'd go away with, eh, it's kind of a bust. It's okay. It's got some interesting features. I mean, I love the salt in this image, but it can be a bust. And so you come out again, and you go out, and you try and capture something amazing, and you're watching it. Oh, look at the cool water reflection. Myself and James Baker hanging out right here, capturing it, sitting in a chair comfortably, enjoying Milky Way photography as we get glistening stars in the water. And it's like, all right, so Salt Flats is getting even better. Salt Flats is getting even more interesting. I kind of like this. I kind of like this. I wonder if it could be even better. And then there's my second favorite image of all time. This reflection in the water. The conditions went from totally dry to mostly dry to a lake that was three to four football fields across that had one inch water 
perfectly on this crystallized salt flat. You can see on the far left how we can drive our truck right out here. But as it started dry out here, we could drive. As it started getting wet, it went into a section of water that gave us a mirror reflection of the Milky Way. And we're praising the Milky Way like a bunch of Instagram cliches. But as we're standing at our tripod, looking up at the Milky Way with crystal clarity, not having the wind over light pollution behind us bug us at all, and looking down at the water and seeing the clarity of the Milky Way in the water at our feet. It was incredible. A little bit of change. Oh, there you are. <laughs> in this folder, I just found what I was looking for earlier. Edge bad and edge bad too. <laughs> Dang it. This is what I was showing was like bad edge to edge photography versus this and this there's different strengths in here that i could have talked about in edge but i totally forgot where i saved those pictures dang it dang you aaron why do you do so many preparations with vague notes so when you're thinking about your milky way photography and you're thinking ah, i need some good conditions know that you can't control them you're not going to be able to guarantee them you're going to have situations that just don't work out, that just aren't perfect. You might you might not show up a delicate arch when it ever has a cloud inversion like this and be like, whoa, holy crap, that's amazing. You might be there during this day and just focus on your other elements of your composition and you're going to get a good image. But if you have the opportunity, if you have the freedom, if you have the adventure in you to keep trying, eventually you're going to get this. And then eventually you're going to be there for this. And you just got to keep putting in the time. This is one reason why I don't like drop in Milky Ways is because I like the lottery winnings of conditions. I like how you come into that situation diligently, ambitiously, and overzealously. And when the conditions arrive, boom, you got it. And everything comes together. I took an image that I've shown already tonight, but I'm going to pull it up again just to emphasize the point that there are some things that you can do to make an image great, and there are some things that you repeat exactly with the exact same methodology, and it's sucky. It's just sucky. So this image, love it. It turned out great. It is my absolute favorite Milky Way to this point. I love panoramas. I'm extremely biased towards them. And so it becomes my favorite image. And this technique of exposure of eight seconds on the top for the sky and one minute each for the foreground, I repeated that process out here. And I'm certain I have it on this list. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh, no, I don't have it on this list. That's a bummer, but I think I can find it. I just want to hit home about the adventure of getting out and that when you go out enough, then you will have moments that are just miracles and you can't control those. But because you went, you can be very happy that you did. This is the best probably version of what I'll find for it. I tried that same technique and in this image, it doesn't work as strong. It's nowhere near as strong of a pano. Even though the terrain is gorgeous, the terrain is cool. Between these two images, you can see the strengths of the sky, the strengths of the foreground. It's just lacking a little bit where it's so strong here, but not so strong there. And I want to comment that Ryan, I want to read the comment that Ryan has right here. I'll leave this up. Um, Charles Mayer first says, uh, Roger Clark needs to chill. Sometimes you want to create a specific mood instead of just an accurate Hershey Milky Way or accurate Hershey Highway. Right, right, right. <laughs> and yes, exactly. And you know what? He told me that if I was saying that this is my artistic take on it, he doesn't care when I say it's an artistic Milky Way. He cares when people say that the Milky Way is this, and this is what the Milky Way looks like, and then you show a blue Milky Way, and it's like, ah, oh, that's not correct, and that's where he gets you know, under his skin. But then Ryan Luna says, yeah, I'm not sure why people think Roger Clark is the authority for sky color. Has he never seen a setting moon behind the camera while Milky Way is rising? Blue sky. And yes, exactly, man. I mean, look at this one image of this guy's pano. Because the moon is out, blue sky. Is that an accurate sky? Yeah, 100%. It's what, the it's what the sky looks like in our atmosphere looking out at the Milky Way. 
totally real that's the milky way if we were in space and capturing the milky way it'd be much different and we have this atmosphere between us that's causing a difference in color so i'm i'm fine with when i see someone like my favorite royce bear having a blue milky way i abs abs absolutely love it and sometimes when i see someone who has a crunchy kind of dark scenario like this it's like oh it could have been better maybe with a little bit more exposure and you'd have more detail there and you would have loved it more and that's actually more accurate to the Milky Way than the color that Royce Bear has chosen, though. So if, Roy, if Roger Clark had to pick between these two images, he'd pick this one, even though it's too green. And, you know, he wouldn't love that about it. But you go ahead, get out there, find the location that has a subject that you love repeat those adventures and try and get the great image and when you're trying to think about the elements that make that great image here's a reminder composition technique and conditions you'll have really brilliant images you go to Google and say hey Google um, can you show me some Milky Way images of delicate arch and which ones are better than the other ones how does something stand out Things will just stand out to you. Like you'll feel it emotionally first. You're like, oh, wow, that's really looking good. And then when you break it down and try and dissect it, you'll find similar to my list that the clear subject, the edge-to-edge -edge focus, it's clean all the way to the edge. You have a clean technique that's being used. You have a clean quality image. The exposure is correct. Your design elements, some of them are included, so you have a great balance. And then you've also had some conditions that just went your way things that didn't ruin your night and absolutely those things combined coming together will give you the moment that you'll be so grateful for that you were out and you went on that adventure like myself and James Baker we were looking for that moment that night and it just we got some really cool images but it's too bad we couldn't find a couple more inches and a couple more football fields of water out at the salt flats that July or that June so it's too bad all right awesome uh, Tim Farmer says, if blue works for you, then it's blue. As photographers, you are not recording exactly what is reality, but our interpretation, unless you are a journalist or a scientist, right? And Chris Whiting says, I'm always amazed at how different the sky looks with equal settings on different nights. Exactly. When someone would ask me in the beginning of, you know, doing photography on YouTube, they'd always want to know the setting. And I did the same thing. Like, what was your setting? Like, if I turn my aperture to that setting that you use, the actual same ISO, and then use the same lens, I'll get the same image and that's just not true you need your conditions to comply and if those comply and everything comes together and you just get that kind of perfect lining up all of the luck of the draw of that night then you can have a terrific sky and a terrific situation and a terrific image and sometimes you just get something that's ho-hum and that's okay it's cool that you went out and don't necessarily drop in a brilliant sky every time but I do appreciate people who are on location that night and just capture the sky from over here versus over there. But it's the same sky that night. Totally respect that. All right. Have I missed questions? Let me double check in the chat right here if I missed any questions that have come through. As I was blitzing through this, I got some cal – okay, will you post them the guild? The calendar. Okay, Tim Farmer says that's great. Thanks. Got it. And I want to remind everybody that if you look into the description here, you will see that this link right there, this bit.ly link will take you to the folder that will, uh, not this one, the folder, I'll just click on it, the folder where people can submit theirs. Hey, Michael McKeague has posted his, awesome. So this is an image of a core panorama, but if you want to post an image that is a, Milky Way winter Milky Way panel. I'd love to see it as part of the challenge for the 21st and I will declare my favorite for the month. So make sure you go into the description here or in any of the Milky Way Wednesdays between now and the 21st, which means just one day. So today and next week, the 14th. And I'll include this link into our emails. If you're already on my email list, I'll include it in there when I remind you about Milky Way Wednesday. So you also have a link there. So it should be easy for you to find. And if you come on the 21st and you just couldn't find the link, but you know you have an image, 
during the live stream, I'll be like, yeah, here's the link again, and I'll paste it in the chat, and you can post it, and we'll have it for that presentation. I might just have to double check to see if yours turned out to be the favorite or not, but you can post it during that hour. Chris Whiting says, go outside and wait for Mars to pop out from behind the moon. Oh, yeah, is that that's what's happening tonight, or is it happening soon? Because there's a conjunction with Mars. Um, I want to go into Stellarium again, but I don't have it, so I'll just go into this app and come over to sky guide and where's the moon and let's go backwards in time oh look at that look at how it kind of rotates close but it doesn't quite hit it now it goes behind it and that was december 7th and that was at 6 p.m let's see right now it's behind because the current time Mars is behind it at 810, and if you go outside right now, depending on where you are, eventually Mars is going to pop outside of it, 9 p.m., my time, mountain time, 10 p.m. it's starting to. You can see that it's starting to. Oh, maybe I shouldn't zoom in so much because it's going to be more like this. I'm going to keep the moon centered, but let's look at this, zooming back. So mountain time, Jerry, myself, those of you in Utah, you guys can appreciate how the Mars occultation is complete or starts to be complete around 930. So like Chris is pointing out, go out and enjoy watching that pull away from the moon. Check it out. That's pretty cool. Maybe I should get my telescope out, but I'm just got so much going on. I got to have some dinner. So, oh, clouds here in St. Louis. Dang it, Tim. That's a bummer. All right, and emphasis from SS Mold and Tim Farmer. It's tonight. It's tonight. It's it's right now. Looks like it's totally happening right now. That's awesome. <laughs> cool. Okay. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for hanging out with me again. I am Aaron King with Photog Adventures. Um, if you're following my YouTube channel and you haven't hit subscribe yet, hit subscribe. Help me out there because I'm going to start doing some uh work and contests to help encourage more people to hit subscribe as well as um. You get notified of these live streams, and I wanted to say that in the new system, if you look at my channel, you will see that uh, most of my recent videos are just the old videos that were pre-produced. It doesn't show my live streams. Live streams are on a separate tab. So if you haven't noticed that yet, you can see how here's the home page with the current live right now, but then all of these old pre-produced videos, and when you go to live then you see all the Milky Way Wednesdays isolated so anything that I've done on a live stream it is showing up here separated from all of the other pre-recorded videos and so if you're on the home page it is isolated um, videos will show just pre-recorded stuff not live and live on the home page you'll actually see shorts if I had some shorts but I don't have any shorts I haven't done that on here I've done on Instagram and, and TikTok, so you won't see the shorts really on my YouTube channel Maybe I should post them. Probably. Probably. Oh, well, just hit that button. Hit subscribe. Join me. All right. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with me. Thanks so much in the chat. Um, Eric Reese says, always appreciate Milky Way Wednesdays. Thanks, Eric, for coming. I appreciate you being here. And Dave from Mamaki says, thanks, Aaron. Everyone have a good night. Uh, went behind during this live. Should pop out soon, Chris reminds us. And Ron says, thanks, Aaron. Hey, thanks, all. Hope you have a good one. I'll be back next week, the 14th, for another Milky Way Wednesday. I'll remind you again about submitting your winter Milky Way panorama. I'm going to go out and get mine here soon. And so it'll be fun to see how things turn out. So have a good one. See you later. Get out there and have an adventure of your own. All right. Later, everyone.